Day two of the Trump criminal trial and our special coverage here on the Midas Touch Network and Legal AF. I'm Ben Micellis, joined by Karen Friedman Agnifilo, who used to serve as the number two in the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. And Karen Friedman Agnifilo, or as we call her and her friends call her, and you can call her KFA. Not only was the number two in the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, she served there for nearly 30 years. So her inside perspective of everything that's going on there, I would say, is the best in the country, even best in the world. Every single day, we're creating a scorecard for you of the main events that happened during the Trump criminal trial. Here are the main things that took place on day two. Donald Trump uh, arrived and started to blame his accountant and lawyer for the fraud that he is being uh, charged with and prosecuted for by the Manhattan District Attorney. We talked briefly about Donald Trump not waiving one of these, uh, not waiving the rights to be at the sidebar every time there's a sidebar with the judge, which was creating major logistical problems. But Donald Trump waived that sidebar, right? We'll break down what that means. The voir dire or the jury selection process resumed. Also, Donald Trump continued to fall asleep again, as he did on day one. There was a moment where Donald Trump made noises and scowled at a prospective juror. Justice Juan Mershon then strongly admonished Donald Trump and directed Donald Trump's a lawyer to tell Donald Trump that he should not do that ever again. Then Donald Trump kind of put up his hands and was like, okay, okay, judge. There was more voir dire that took place. And the first six jurors from the first panel of prospective jurors of 96 were sworn in. So they're one third there, six jurors from the batch of 96 prospective jurors after today's voir dire process. Karen, I just want to show some of the kind of key highlights before getting your take right here. This was Donald Trump entering the courthouse today where he blamed his lawyer and accountant. Let's play this clip. Thank you very much. This is a trial that should have never been brought. It's a trial that is being looked upon and looked at all over the world, they're calling. They're, they're looking at it and analyzing it. Every legal pundit, every legal scholar said this trial is a disgrace. We have a Trump-hating judge. We have a judge who shouldn't be on this case. He's totally conflicted. But this is a trial that should never happen. It should have been thrown out a long time ago. If you look at uh, Jonathan Turley, Andy McCarthy, all great legal scholars, there's not one that we've been able to find that said this should be a trial. I called a, I was, I was paying a lawyer and marked it down as a legal expense, some accountant, I didn't know, marked it down as a legal expense. That's exactly what it was. And you get indicted over that? I should be right now in Pennsylvania, in Florida, in many other states, North Carolina, Georgia, campaigning. This is all coming from the Biden White House because the guy can't put two sentences together. He can't campaign. They're using this in order to try and win an election. And it's not working that way. It's working the opposite way. So check it out. Legal expense. It's called legal expense. That's what you're supposed to call it. Mr. Trump, get it out of us and nobody's ever seen it. Nobody has ever seen anything like it. So thank you very much for coming. I'm now going to sit down for many hours. I am now going to sit down. The voters understand it. All you have to do is look at the polls. This is a sham trial. And the judge should recuse the judge. You know, this is totally conflicted. Thank you very much. The government will use the independence to say it won't vote for you if you're convicted. So the amount of lies he's able to fit in there, lie after lie after lie. Every legal scholar is not saying that he did nothing wrong. And then he blames his lawyer and his accountant then somehow says that Biden has to do with this, which is not true. And then he acts like he's up in the polls when he's actually not up in the polls anymore. Two more clips, Karen, before I toss it to you for the rest of this, because I just want to frame this all as we 
course, build the audience here. This is what Alina Haba just said moments ago, um, where she compared Donald Trump uh, threatening witnesses and being admonished by Justice Mershon to Nelson Mandela. Let's play this clip. Judge admonishing the defendant. I've seen it time and time again. I've been admonished like that. It's by design. It's to make you appear to be uh, inept. It's to make you appear to be stupid in front of a jury. And don't think that it's not intentional. You know, well, all, the, ask, all the trolls, all the journalists, they'll they'll put that yeah, out there. And, and I make mean, a lot of like people would interpret that on both. And then Alina Haba was asked about Donald Trump continuing to fall asleep during the proceedings. Let's play that clip. Let's have a second, but you know, there's two reports both days of him falling asleep in, in court. Any reaction to that? Is he tired? Has he just been running around a lot or a, any thoughts on that? If anything, he's probably brutally bored. I mean, he, it's 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 painful. They make him sit there through jury selection. The first day was procedural, uh, but no, you know, I've heard that report. It's unlikely. I know him. I sat through trial after trial with him. That never happens. Well, so that you have. Uh, President Trump is is incredibly focused. <laughs> All right, Alina, thank you as always. Great to have you here. And then she always has that tell at the end. She'd be the worst poker player where she goes, <laughs> Karen Frieda Magnifolo, let me bring you in. What do you make of today's proceedings? Where are we at? I think I'm going to win that bet with Popak. Uh, he said that jury selection is going to take two weeks. I said, I don't think so. I think we're going to have a, a jury by the end of this week. And it's looking more and more like that is the case. I don't want to count. I don't want to count my lunch, my free lunch before I, uh, before the end of the week, but it's going faster as I suspected. Day one is always uh, slow. It's always a lot of housekeeping, a lot of things that you have to that you have to take care of, fine tunings, rulings, all of that. And so that's what we saw yesterday. And then they have to bring in the, the jurors. And it's very common when you have either a high profile case or a long case that you lose about half the people saying, I can't do it. They either look for excuses to get off or they look for, um, they, they say they can't sit on that case and for various reasons, because they can't be fair and impartial. And, and I, I have found that jurors take their responsibility very, very seriously. And if they, even if they hate Donald Trump, they recognize the solemnity of a criminal trial and sitting in judgment of somebody and how important that is. And they will say, I can't, I can't look at the evidence fairly or impartially because my dislike of him is so much is such that I can't be fair and impartial and they will self-select off the jury. And that's what we see has happened so far. So many jurors have said, have reached deep inside themselves and have, uh, have come forward to say that they can't be fair in this case. And so the system is working uh, and I'm, I'm pleased to see that. A few other things that, that come up or that have come up is who are the lead lawyers in this particular case? Um, the lead lawyers, it turns out, it's looking like it's Josh Steinglass and uh, and Todd Blanche for the defense. And and the reason that's significant is is when you have a, a group of lawyers trying a case, it's who's sitting in the aisles, right? Who are the people who are sitting in the aisles, like? So if the table on the left, you're sitting in the aisle um, to the right. And then if you're the table on the right, you're sitting closest to the left. And I saw in the sketches that was Todd Blanche sitting there and the defendant next and and um, Josh Steinglass sitting in the, in the first seat for in the first chair uh, for the prosecution. They are also the lawyers who went first during voir dire, which also signals that they're the lead lawyer. So, so that just is interesting because they're gonna be the ones who are going to be connecting with the jurors. They're gonna probably be the ones who give the summation or the main part of the summations. And so they're the ones who are establishing a rapport with the jury, because if you're the lead lawyer, you're the one who's going to be looking the jury in the eye and asking them to, find the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt or find that the people have not proven their case beyond a reasonable doubt. So that's the other thing I, I noticed that came forward. So you see Josh Steinglass right there uh, sitting in the first chair and then Todd Blanche in that sketch that's up there right now. 
they're both in the first chair seats. Uh, a couple of things that I thought were interesting. We have six jurors already. So we need 18. There's going to be 12 jurors and six alternates, and we have six. So, so it's going much faster, which happens after day one, right? So, so to, by tomorrow, uh, I think we're we're going actually tomorrow's Wednesday. They're not sitting tomorrow. So by Thursday, I bet we have the full jury and by Friday we'll have the alternates. And, uh, and the, ju and the judge thinks so too, because the judge asked the jury to come back the the six sworn jurors next week. He did swear them, he, which means he had them raise their right hand and, um, and they are sworn jurors. So, so we have six sworn jurors, which is, is absolutely significant. And, and we're rocking and rolling as they say a couple of things that came up during voir dire that I thought was very interesting uh, today during the jury selection process was uh, was a couple of things, and I, I wrote them down. Um, I thought Josh Steinglass, who was questioning the jury, he said, uh, he said, do you understand the difference between believability versus likability? And there, I think he's talking about some of the witnesses, uh, and and he's talking about whether when the witnesses testify, you may not like them, but but do you understand the difference of believability versus likability and about testing someone and making sure that uh, there's corroboration and seeing if you think that, you know, looking at their demeanor, et cetera, and um, seeing if people can put their personal preferences aside and, and really make a judgment about someone's credibility based on that. And I, I thought that was a really good point that he made. And um, he also, Josh Steinglass, the prosecutor, also asked the jurors, asked one of the jurors at least, can you find him guilty? Um, can you look at this defendant? He made him look at, he made each juror look at the defendant, uh, Trump, and say, could you, if we prove our case beyond the reasonable doubt, could you find him guilty? And he made each one of them say yes. And, and according to the reporting, Trump looked at each of those jurors as well. And that's significant because, again, you have to be able to do that. When they come out, you have to be able to uh, look the defendant in the eye and say, and say, uh, you know, I find that, that you find him guilty. And, and, and in New York, York, at least what normally happens is the defense attorney, if there's a guilty verdict, you know, the four person comes in, they stand up, the judge says, uh, says, has the jury reached a verdict? The judge checks the, ju the verdict sheet, they hand the verdict sheet back to the four person of the juror. And the four person, by the way, is always juror number one. It's not like you can pick someone else the way you can in other jurisdictions where someone can volunteer to be the first person. In New York, it's, it's whoever's seated in, in uh, seat number one. So we have a four person already um, because we have six jurors. And, and so then they say, what's your verdict? And they will stand up and say, um, and say uh, I, we find the defendant guilty or not guilty. And if it's guilty, what the defense attorneys normally do is they go and they, they ask that the jurors be polled. And that means one by one, the clerk or the judge will ask each juror, juror number two, uh, the, the four person has said that you have found the defendant guilty. Is that your verdict? And they have to say yes. And they go and they ask that question to each one of them. And every once in a while, someone says, changes their mind or panics or says, no, I was bullied. So it's an important thing to be able to look him in the eye, look him in the face and be able to say that. So Josh Steinglass made sure that each of them could do that and, and Todd Blanche got up and he then questioned the jurors. And this was after the judge, if you remember, asked those 42 questions and everyone went through them all. Then the lawyers went and it was the prosecutor first and then, and then, uh, and then the defendant's um, lawyers, Todd Blanche did. And I'm just looking at my notes right now. And he was really talking about things like uh, political views and can you put your political views aside? And do you realize that you may not like Trump, but feelings are not facts, um, things like that. Someone became a citizen while Trump was president. And he said, do you have, does that give you any feelings that are going to make you not be able to be fair and impartial? And they said, no. Um, one juror told Todd Blanche that he finds Trump fascinating, that he can come into the room and, and that everyone's looking at him and interested in him and writing about him. And another juror even said that they appreciate Trump's candor and that he speaks his mind. So it's the opposite, by the way, of what Trump was saying, that he can't get a fair 
an impartial jury. These are people who I didn't hear anything that was, I hate Trump. I can't uh, be fair and impartial. I can't listen, anything like that. So then they will go to what's called the four cause challenges, which is challenges that are, this guy is so, is so um, biased that he can't be fair uh, on this case. And the prosecutor, they, they go to the prosecutor first, which is, is what the law requires. And, and Josh Steinglass says, no, we don't have any four cause challenges. So then they, then they go to the defense and say to the defense, do you have any four cause challenges? Um, the defense and by Todd Blanche uh, said that they had multiple, uh, multiple four cause challenges. And what was interesting about that is it was after the lunch break. So between the time that Todd Blanche questioned the jurors and, and then at this point when they were going through the challenges, there was a lunch break. And during that time, the, all the lawyers went on the public social media of the prospective jurors. And one thing to note, when you look on social media, uh, when you go on social media to look up jurors, you can only look in the public areas. You can't ask to friend them. You can't try to connect with them. That would be considered contact with a juror. And lawyers are not allowed to have any contact with jurors or prospective jurors whatsoever. And that that is like a bright, bright line. And it is the thing that that everybody lives by. And it's very difficult because sometimes you're in the elevator and a juror's in there. You know, we've been taught from day one, never talk in the elevators because you don't know who's there. It could be a juror. Don't, you know, you walk down the hall, you go to the bathroom, you run into a juror. It's awkward. They, they say hi. And, and you want to say hi back, but you really can't. You cannot have any contact with the juror. So judges usually tell the jury, uh, they usually give a charge to the jury and say, look, don't be offended if you see the lawyers or any of the parties or the defendant in the elevator or in the hallways and they don't speak to you. You cannot speak. You cannot have any contact. It is it is it is the one thing that you could do to derail a case would be to have any contact with the juror whatsoever. So that includes, like I said, the social media posts. So so the defense attorneys had gone on social media and I'm sure the prosecutors did, too, and came back and said uh, there were hostile there were hostile Facebook and social media posts. And I think some of these jurors are biased. And they brought up some of uh, some of those, what they said were hostile media posts and um, made numerous four cause challenges. Some were granted, some weren't. And the reason that's significant is, is especially if you're Trump's lawyers, you want as many jurors excused that you don't like for cause because you only get 10 perempts. And so you don't want to use them all up. You don't want to use them on, uh, you don't want to use them on ones that you, you don't know if you like them or you don't really like them, but you don't know who's coming down the pike. You don't know who's in the next batch, right? So it's this whole chess game that goes on. And the thing that the prosecutor did um, that I loved was uh, they didn't use any peremptory challenges at first. <laughs> so I thought that was amazing. Um, because strategically that forces the defense to use peremptory challenges for ones that they don't like. And sure enough, Todd Blanche ended up using six of his 10 peremptory challenges. So he only has four left and they still have six people to go. So to choose. So they used a lot of people, but you know, look, there were, there were Facebook posts that, uh, that some of them were memes or jokes, right? Somebody said, uh, posted a joke that said, orange is the new black, or, you know, I think referring from Obama to when it went from Obama to Trump or something like that. And the judge is getting frustrated saying, look, you know, you should ask, if you have a problem with these kinds of posts, you should ask the jury about it when you're voir direing them, because what was required to happen at that point, when you're done, when they're done with that voir dire part where you're asking questions and then they went to lunch and then looked at the social media, they had to call back the jurors and ask about these uh, offending social media posts. So, so they brought them back in. It was getting, it was delaying things because they had to question them one by one. And the, the judge did end up giving, um, 
giving some uh, for cause challenges to uh, to the defense. And so some of them were stricken, but based on that. And so the, the prosecution also exercised a few peremptory challenges. I'm seeing conflicting reporting. One said three, the other says four. Um, I'm not exactly sure, but they did get six jurors left. And now they brought a whole new panel of 96 people into the courtroom and they're starting all over again, which again, is usual. This is how it goes. It's, it's slow. It's not that slow, actually. This is going, um, yep. as, this is going as fast as, as all the juries I've ever picked. Uh, the fact that they have six jurors on day two is, is fairly normal. And so, so here we go. We're, I think we have a juror, jury very soon. Karen, we're getting some reporting that with the first six jurors selected, that a four person has already been selected. Now, is that usual in New York criminal practice that the four person is pre-selected? I know sometimes the four person is often selected amongst the jury pool. Let me just uh, read out a description. This is per the pool reporters who the four person is believed to be. It's uh, They're described by just their numbers. B400 will serve as the four person per the pool reporters. A man wearing a black t-shirt and carrying a black backpack. He lives in West Harlem, but is originally from Ireland. He works in sales and previously worked as a waiter and attended some college. He is married and his spouse is in school and they have no children. In his spare time, he enjoys doing anything outdoorsy. He gets his news from the New York Times, the Daily Mail, and some Fox News and MSNBC, seat four B400. So uh, that may seem like an unusual process for some that the four persons already selected. How, how does that work, Karen? So in New York, the four person is juror number one automatically. So that's why we have a four person already. He just happens to be juror. He, you know, they, they seat people in order. So the next per so we have six jurors. The first one that was picked is in seat number one and is the four person. The second one is in seat number two. And it goes from right to left, believe it or not, the who's juror number one. So so um, it, it, that's all it is. And that's why we have a four person already. Here was some of the uh, description from some of the reporters who were there uh, when Justice Mershon admonished Donald Trump for intimidating a prospective juror. Um, Adam Klasfeld talks about uh, when Trump's lawyer questioned a juror about Facebook posts, the former president reacted audibly and visibly. After she left, Justice Mershon angrily warned him via his lawyer, I will not have any jurors intimidated in this courtroom. I want to make that crystal clear. Norm Eisen reported breaking. Judge is hammering Trump for juror intimidation. He was acting out while last juror was speaking. Blanche is trying, that's Trump's lawyer, Todd Blanche, is trying to justify it, but has to do with juror intimidation. And the DA is pushing back. And then Katie Fang wrote, Per Judge Mershon, this female juror was about 12 feet away from Trump when he said something to her. Todd Blanche whispered something to Trump after Justice Mershon tells the defense to speak to their client, and Trump waved his hands as if to indicate that he understands. And Karen, I want you to react to that, but I want to tell everybody who is watching here and in just a few minutes, we will be starting the Political Beatdown podcast, and that is co-hosted with Michael Cohen, who, of course, is a witness in this case. So in a little bit, I will be jumping over there. If you just stay in this room, this YouTube room, you will be automatically moved over to Political Beatdown, where you perspective from Michael Cohen. So you're getting the perspective here from the Number two at the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, Karen Freed Agnifilo. Then we're going to go to our next broadcast where you'll hear from Michael Cohen, a witness in the case. I would say that our coverage here at the Midas Touch Network has um, the people who know the most about what's going on. And I want to remind everybody as well that every morning, Karen Friedman Agnifilo and I will be giving these summaries and after court proceedings, we will be doing this. But Karen, court will be dark tomorrow on Wednesday, correct? So there will not be court proceedings tomorrow. But Karen, why don't you kind of summarize 
where we're at right now as we conclude this, maybe respond to Justice Mershon's admonition, and then uh, we will move over. I will be moving over uh, to the co-host political beatdown. Yeah, so look, Judge Mershon um, is basically, you're seeing him control the courtroom. He's not reacting when Trump talks about the witnesses as strongly as you might like, or when he's talking about the prosecutor or the judge, but you get even close to uh, intimidating a juror or having anything that could potentially um, interrupt the jury process. You're, that's a third rail for a judge, especially Judge Mershon. He has to protect this jury. And so Trump utter, had, did audible utterances. He's only 12 feet away from the jury uh, or the prospective jurors. And the judge shot that down quickly. And we'll do that every single time. That It's not just a fear intimidation that he's shooting down. It's also inappropriate information that's not testimony, that's not sworn, that's not evidence. Uh, it, it, you just can't do that. You, if you if he has something to say, he has to get on the witness stand, raise his right hand and swear under oath like every other witness. You can't, you can't give uh, extraneous information to the jury. And certainly you can't intimidate them. And, and Donald Trump is a bully and can be intimidating. And just by virtue of the fact that he was the power Power dynamic, right? He used to be the president of the United States. So, so that could be very intimidating to a prospective juror. And so, so Juan Mershon, the judge is going to absolutely protect the jury from that. So, so that is absolute, that was the third rail. And you're going to see more of that when he, uh, if, if anything else happens um, and Donald Trump does that. So far, I will say he has been seemingly behaving. Um, you don't see any of the outbursts that, that you've seen in some of the other trials. So I think that's a good thing uh, that we're seeing. Um, you know, you're going to tomorrow we're, on Wednesdays, we're off uh, typically this case because it's his, the judge's calendar day, although he did say that we might sit on certain Wednesdays. We're going to revisit that depending on how slow this goes, but for now. And, uh, and so Court goes from 9.30 to 4.30 with lunch from 1 to 2.15 every day. And that's what it seems like it's happening. It's it's slow, it's boring, and it's exactly the way every other trial is. It's not taking any longer than other cases. It's not going faster than other cases. This feels very familiar, like a routine jury selection for almost any other case. So so that's where, that's where we are. And so, you know, we'll be giving these to um, our listeners every single day that we have court or that there's any information to impart. We'll be doing these uh, these Trump on trial reports, Ben, me and you, because I think it's important to get this information out to people so they know exactly what's happening. Um, and you know we're staying apprised and, and we're looking and reading uh, everything that's going on in the courtroom and we're gonna accurately report it to people and interpret it to, you know, for people. So so um, yeah, so that that's where we are uh, on this, in this case. We have six jurors, and um, I think we're, we will have a sworn jury by the end of this week, by Friday. Well, Karen Freeman Agnifilo, if I was Popak, I would not bet against you with regards to the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, Karen the number two, the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. She worked there for almost 30 years. The time she was there actually coincided a little bit with the time Special Counsel Jack Smith was there. Karen knew Special Counsel Jack Smith from those days. It is such an honor to be able to co-host these updates with you to provide this timely and accurate information to all those watching. And for all those watching, please make sure you hit subscribe on the YouTube channel if you you're not subscribed. Sometimes people think they are subscribed to the channel because they, they check so frequently the Midas Touch updates, but they don't realize they didn't click that subscribe button. So hit that subscribe button right now and tell your family members, your friends, your coworkers, anybody you know about the Midas Touch Network, about this YouTube channel. This live feed is always going to be there even after we finish this live. So you can then send this link to anybody who you wanted to give them the update. Update and say, hey, 
I know you're watching Legacy Media. They're not really doing a good job breaking this down in depth, in detail. Why don't you listen to what Karen Friedman Agnifilo has to say? Send them this link. Tell people about this network, about this YouTube channel. Let's keep growing this community together. Of course, if you want to help out in any way further, you can always go to patreon.com slash Midas Touch, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Midas Touch. And without further ado, I'm going to head over right now to meet Michael Cohen, where we're going to start our next live. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to go anywhere. YouTube will automatically send you there. I'm going to then take about a 30-second break to reset, and then we're going to start, and you'll be able to hear the perspective from Michael Cohen about day one and day two on the show I do with him called Political Beatdown. Karen Friedman Agnifilo, thank you so much for your insight. It is, again, such an honor to do this with you each and every day. You can all follow along on our Trump scorecards. We did a day one. Those are the day two developments right there. Take a screenshot if you want it. Thank you, everybody, for watching this update. Ben Micellis, Karen Friedman Agnifilo, signing off. Shout out to the Legal AFers and shout out to the Midas Mighty. Enough! Send it to the big house, not the White House. Get the new exclusive tees, mugs, and stickers right now at store.midastouch.com. That's store.midastouch.com.